chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Uh, and if you don't mind, please stand. Anytime I get a chance to, to speak, I, um, I, I, I like to stand for the reading of the word initially. I just think it, it honors God that they did it in uh, the Bible. And I think if they can do it in the Bible, they can, it's good enough for us, right? Revelation chapter 2, verses 1. And after I'm done, just remain standing and bow your heads. And then uh, I'll go ahead and pray. And then you can be seated. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things said the Lord, said, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how canst thou not bear them which are evil? And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, uh, and hast patience. And for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I am somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, thou that hatest the deeds of the Nicol Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that, hate, he, hath, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. The Spirit saith unto the church, to him overcometh, and I will eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Bow my hands and let's pray. Father God, uh, just thank you uh, that we get a chance to, to share your word today, Father God. I, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would just move me out the way, that I would just be an open conduit, Father God, in which you could just pour your anointing, Father God, to reach out to the church. Uh, right now, Father God, I, I, I don't want to have any part of this, Father God. This is all about you. Uh, so I, I say no to myself, Father God, and I say yes to you, Father God. Have an impact in this place. Father God, touch the lives, Father God, that we can leave better than we came in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, uh, the last couple of, uh, of, of uh, weeks we've been, we've been preaching about the church. We, we all kind of came together. We said we wanted to do this message uh, while Dad was gone uh, entitled Being the Church. Uh, week one, uh, and for those of you who were, which, were, which were here, which weren't here, I'll kind of give you a quick recap. Uh, Brother Cliff uh, brought forth the foundation, what the foundation of the church, where the church started, its roots. We, he talked about things like Peter, upon this rock, uh, you shall build my church. Uh, week two, Brother Doug uh, talked about the response to salvation. He talked about love. He talked about what are we, how we're we supposed to act. How do we respond to this thing as the church? Uh, this week, uh, my task is to give you the picture of how the church uh, can, can be doing, have all the right motives, but still fail. Uh, I want to talk to you this week about the church in Ephesus. And, and before I, I kind of go into the church in Ephesus, I want to give you a little bit of historical context, uh, okay, so, so we can kind of uh, work our way through this thing. Uh, Dr. Stephen Alford always said that uh, a text out of context uh, it, it is a pretext, okay? So I, I want to make sure I don't give you a pretext in, in, in this sermon, but I, I want to make sure that you, you get the background of where I'm going uh, so we can see the full picture of, of, of uh, what was going on with the church at Ephesus. Um, the church at Ephesus is one of seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, if, if those of you which don't know your history, uh, Asia Minor is now modern-day Turkey. It was there with uh, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatra, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, and obviously Ephesus was the seventh church. Uh, at Ephesus was a huge, huge place. If, if I were to uh, parallel uh, the Roman Empire to the United States, Ephesus would be New York City. Uh, it was huge. It was the hub. It was the epicenter of everything going on socially and economically. Um, it had a theater which seated 50,000 people. The, the temple to the Greek goddess Diana was one of the seven wonders of the ancient church, of the ancient world. It was huge. It was right across from the Aegean, so there was a port there where you could do business economically in that section. Uh, needless to say, this was a huge place. This is where the group of believers decided that they would plant their church in Ephesus. Man, isn't that, isn't that crazy? They were being the church in Ephesus. Hey, guess what? It's like being the church in New York City. What a challenge. This is what they, they, they decided to do. Amidst the decadence, the paganism, adversary, debauchery, a lot of things that most of us, I, I would, as believers, would be afraid 
afraid to go into, right? This was in the thick. They were in the jungle. Do you guys remember this song, Welcome to the Jungle? Who even got fun to get me? Hey, listen, this is where they were at. They were, they were in the jungle. They were in that place where all this craziness was going on. And they decided, hey, we want to be the church. We want to share the gospel in this community. We want to live in this community. We want to impact this environment. We want to, co to confront people with the message of the cross. This is where they decided to be the church. This is where the people in Ephesus decided to, that they would share the gospel. We first encountered encounter these people in, in the church in Ephesus in Ephesians. Here, this is where Paul, the writer, is in jail most of the time. And he, he writes letters to encourage them. He tells them to stand. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Because they were a church which was perseverant. In fact, if you go to uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 14, it starts off like this. It says, I haven't done all stand, stand therefore, having girded up your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, with all taking up the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one, and take up the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. What, what, what a powerful, encouraging word Paul infuses into the lifeblood at the church at Ephesus. This, this, this metropolis, this, this huge place where all the distractions possible could be. He says, guys, you've been standing, but continue to stand. You've been persevering, but continue to persevere. And this is how you do it. Put on the whole armor of God. We see this church which is excited, which is ready to go out and witness, which is ready to impact this neighborhood in this place which is too big to fathom. This is in the beginning. They're saying we, we're, 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 we're ready to impact our neighborhood. It makes you think, doesn't it? Why can't we uh, impact our neighbors when we don't even have the freedom that they did? When they don't even have the freedom that we did? Think about this. They were under the persecution of death. Why, why, why can't we reach Buffalo? Is that really hard when we stand up in here and, 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 and dad begins to preach if you believe and I believe and we together pray the Holy Spirit must come down and Buffalo shall be saved? When we sing this song, it, we, we kind of think, man, that's, that's kind of big. What? Buffalo? <laughs> These guys were in Ephesus. They were being the church in Ephesus. Is, is it really that hard? Why can't we reach our neighborhood here in Chicawanda? Right? Is, is it really that hard? They were in Ephesus. They were being the church. Yeah, that's right. They were in Ephesus. And, 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 and I think probably me more than, than most, I know us here in Believers, we all made excuses. Uh, we don't have our own building. We don't have a sign. We don't have the right equipment. Those are excuses. They were being the church in Ephesus. There is no excuse when you have people in China and in the Middle East packing houses, okay, under the fear of death and execution, being the church. What is our excuse? What, what is our excuse? The last picture we see of the Ephesians, uh, it, 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 it is, is, uh, of, the, of the church of Ephesus is in Ephesians. Paul continuing to encourage them. This church was on point. They were the standard. They were the model. This is the way the church was supposed to be. We have this great taste in our mouth coming from the church in Ephesians. What, what, a, what a beautiful picture of this church. We arrive in, in Revelations chapter 2. God is, 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 is Jesus Christ is writing a, a, a letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor. We, we get to the text that we wrote, read in the beginning. He's, he's writing a, 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 a letter to the church in Asia Minor. And obviously, right, he's going to start with his star pupil, the church in Ephesus. This, this beautiful church which has been the model, which has been the standard. I mean, look at it like this. If you want to let them show the class how you're supposed to do things, you're going to use your star pupil as the example, aren't you? So we, we get to Revelations uh, chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. I know the works and the toil and the patience, the Bible says. And how can us not bear evil men? And did try them that call themselves apostles, and they are not, and didn't find them false. And thou hast patience and did bear for my name's sake, and hast grown weary. Oh, I 
obviously, right? Of course! This is the church in Ephesus. This is the standard. This is the model. Listen, God, Jesus is saying in the beginning of that letter, you guys rock. You did it. You're being perseverant. Of course. We're the church in Ephesus. We're being the church. We're being the church. But, but wait a second. The letter doesn't stop there. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. I'm sure John Mark's got it up on the screen. But I have this against thee, that thou didst leave. The King James Version says, Forgotten thy first love. Remember, therefore, whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Or else I will come to thee, and I will move thee from thy candlestick out of the place where it said thou repent. What? How, how, is this, how is this possible? How, 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 is, how is this possible? We, we were being the church. We, we, were, we, we, we were on top of our doctrine. Uh, we, we went to Bible study on Wednesdays. Uh, Sunday we were in church. We even came early. We, we, we were being the church, weren't we? Uh, when, when people try to come up and, and preach a false doctrine, we, 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 we say, no, that's false.
Are we being the church? It's so easy to come here Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, but if you're not being the church, you're not doing anything. Maybe the situation became, became hopeless. Whatever the case may be, they decided it's better to be just among themselves, isolated and separated. The second thing that we see when, when we go through the text, we, we exegete the scripture, uh, they became lofty in their approach to witness. He says, remember, you were following. How do we know that? Jesus writes them, remember, you were following. They started saying, we're better than them. They don't have the truth. We're better than them. We don't have to tell them the truth. They became lofty in their approach to witness. And Jesus reveals them. You were in their position. Remember you had fallen. In verse 5 he says, remember you had fallen. It's funny to me when, 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 I, when I talk to people where I have a lot of friends which, which I associate with, uh, some believers, some not believers, atheists, whatever, uh, when they, when, and this is their number one reason. Those which have left the church in times past or those which have recently left the church in times past, it's for this very reason. We become locked in our approach. We start talking from a platform down to people. This is what happened here. We, have, we, we believe, oh, we're, 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 we're doing what the Bible says. So we can talk down to people. Listen, no one's saying don't speak the truth, but you're speaking in love. Amen. We start talking down to people. I, I, I'm going to say something a little bit controversial here. I, I know people, I know Christians, which won't even sit down and talk with someone who's of homosexual orientation. How is that being the church? How is that showing the love of Jesus? We, 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 we sit there and we talk down to people and we wonder why they can't receive the love of the gospel. We're being lofty in, in our witness. We're being lofty in our approach. And we wonder why we can't we can even sit down and talk to that sinner because obviously our sin is not as much as their sin. When we were lying and cheating and backbiting, Amen. that that sin is, is, is not as bad as that sin. So we become locked in our approach. And guess what? We chase people out of the church. Yeah. And this is what was happening in Ephesus. They were separated and isolated. They were locked in. They said, listen, we don't want you here because you're not doing it like we want to do it. I love this pastor's name is Artie Vernon. He always says this, you've got to catch a fish before you clean it. Yeah. <laughs> Am I right, Jake? Yeah. I don't know how to fish in a while, but don't you have to catch that bad boy before you clean it and cut it? Yeah. Do you catch fish which are, which are clean? No. But why do we feel in the church that we can do that? That people have to come clean when we were the messiest and most disgusting when we came in. And to tell the truth, we still are. Amen. It's just by the, by, by the blood of Jesus. They were, they were lofty in their approach. They, they ran them out. <laughs> Number three, you're still with me. They forgot their first love. They forgot their first love. They forgot what was most important. They forgot what was most important. Jesus says, what is the greatest commandment? Uh, a, man comes, a man comes up to him, a Pharisee, he says, he, he thinks he's going to trap Jesus in this moment. He says, he says, oh. he says, Jesus, of all the commandments, what's the greatest? I, I can imagine Jesus sitting there as he's, as he's, he's probably sitting uh, uh, as he's talking to the people, as he did. And I can see him look at, at that Pharisee. With a smile on his face, not, not a sarcasm or, 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 or to look down on him, but with compassion because he knows he's wrong in his heart. And Jesus smiles and says in Luke chapter 10, verse 27, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The church of Ephesus had forgotten about this simple rule. This is the greatest commandment. This is where your first love should be. They had forgotten about this. They had forgotten about their first love. They had forgotten to love their neighbor. They 
were separated, they were isolated, they were locked in their approach. They had forgotten about their first love. What, 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 what is going on here? What, 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 is, what do we see in this text? This, this beautiful picture of this church, which was first in Ephesians, is no longer that same church. In fact, some, some theologians even mark it in the text as the loveless church. This church which was, which was, which was encouraged to, to continue on, to persevere. And they were doing that. They were persevering in their doctrine. They were persevering in their, in, in, in their, their relationship with God, with each other even. But that's where it stopped. Listen, I'm not telling you that that's wrong. In fact, Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus even compliments them on that, of, of checking people with false doctrine. He, said, he says, listen, to the, Nicola to the Nicolaitans, which were this group of believers which mixed paganism and Christianity, he says, I'm glad that you're, 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 you're stopping people with false doctrines. He's, he says, continue to persevere. Remember in the beginning, he starts off beautifully. You guys are doing great, but that's not enough. That's not enough. He says, listen, you're, you're reading your Bible every day. You're coming to church, all those great things, but that's not enough. Because at the end of the day, if you're not doing it in love, it's meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. Number four, number four, if we don't want to fall into the same thing that the church at Ephesus did, which I'm afraid that every church can, even our church. We got to adhere to Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Love God more. Love people more. Love God more. Love people more. Luke 10, 27 says, love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's where we have to be. That's where we have to be. Listen. How many times have you gone to your neighbor and said, listen, I just want to love on you. I want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, we, we've come up with this excuse, especially in this century, we've come up with this excuse of saying, well, they will just see me by the way that I walk. <laughs> hey, listen, that's great. That's the beginning. But you have to open up your mouth. If nobody here knows me and you see me walking around, are you going to know my name is Elijah? You can say, man, that guy's a good person. He has a great smile. But at some point in time, you have to have a conversation with me so that you can get to know me and I can get to know you. How do they know that you are saved? How do they know that you're believers? We're not loving people. We're not talking to them. Our neighbors, we know neighbors, we know friends, we know colleagues which are not saved. And it is a, a, a absolute sad thing, so much so that God said, I will take your candlestick out of this place. You will no longer have a light to shine because you are hogging the free gift of God which was given to you because someone else paid the price. So when we don't go and share our faith, when we don't go and love, this is what happens. God says, I will snatch your candlestick out of this place. It is that simple. There is no either or. Our gift, the gift that God gave us was for us to share. Not in a, in a mean, hurtful way, but in love. If we're not showing people love, if we're not witnessing to people in love, then we're failing. Then we have stopped being the church in Ephesus as Ephesus was, and we are just being, and, we, and then we're just a church meeting in Ephesus. We stop being the church in Chitawaga, we're just a church at Chitawaga. And you can go up and down the streets, you can just see churches at Chitawaga. I want to be different. Yeah, I want to be the church. Yeah. 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 This is what God has called us to. Sister Jackie, I'm going to close right here. Do you mind? Playing something softly so I can sound a little bit more spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> you know when you, you get to you get at the end of your your sermon, you get to in the name of Jesus and then the piano's playing. It just gives me goosebumps. I love it so much. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter 13. I think Paul best says it like this. 
I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love. I have a noisy dog or a clanging symbol. And if I have a prophetic power and understanding of all mysteries and knowledge, and if, all, if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wondering, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As of prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know not in part, as, as, so we, as we know not in part, and we are prophecy in part. But when the perfect, when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I responded like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in, in mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and I shall know fully. Even as I have been fully known, so now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the grace of these is love. Please stand with me. Whatever you head down, every eye closed. I want to challenge you guys a little bit. For a second, just think of these words. God, God gave this idea, and at the end of my sermon, I just started writing, and God just gave me this. He said, if Jesus had to write a letter to Home City Church, what would it say, do you think? What if he were to write you a personal letter to you? What do you think that would say? Would it say that you were being the church? Or would it say he was about to take your last stand off? I have a charge for everyone here. All of you who are called Home City Church, this body, not this building, but this body, each of you, you are Home City Church. Make an effort to see those around you who are lost, those who are hurting, your neighbor, your friend, your colleague, and be the church. In this neighborhood, be the church. In your everyday life, be the church. You may ask me, how do we do this? We do by loving God more and loving people. something really quick. You're standing next to someone. You're standing next to someone. I want you to leave that person you're standing next to. I want you to go to someone that you just shake their hands during that little 30 seconds of, of, of shaking their hand. And I want you to, 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 to you to give them a prayer request. And for them to give you a prayer request. And I want you to pray with them. Uh, we don't want just that 30 seconds and then at the end of service we kind of hang around for two seconds and we leave. No, we're going to practice right now being the church, getting in someone's personal space and getting to know them for about five minutes. I want you to go to somebody who's not around you and say, what, what can I pray for? And we're going to pray and then after that I'm going to pray in close service. 